Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, I think when uh, most of us when it comes to like, uh, customizing a behavior or chip, right? These are the typical three options that we use, right? We write a microcontroller firmware, or we write software that runs on a microprocessor, or you can also use FPGA bit stream, right? Okay. Most of us do not think of another one more option, uh, which is a custom chip, right? So a custom chip, okay, so the more specific term is called ASIC. It stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Okay, so basically a chip that you specifically built for a one purpose. Okay, so the benefits of ASIC compared to most other general purpose chips, ASICs are generally have better performance, they have lower power consumption, and they are generally cheaper at high volumes. Okay. So why are then not more people designing chips? Because there's a lot of other disadvantages with ASICs, actually. Okay, so the first disadvantage is it's very expensive. Okay, so the typical figure, right, for one single tape out. So tape out basically means producing a chip, okay? It's five to seven figures. Very expensive, okay? And after you tape it out, you cannot change anything. Really. It's basically fixed. So if you make a mistake, then too bad, you have to spend another five to seven figures again to make another next iteration, okay? The development tools are very costly. So to give you an example, a ballpark, all right, is six figures annually for one seat, you know. It's like a few million dollars eh, for one person to use a software for one year, okay? And on top of that, you need to sign an NDA, okay? So in the, in the NDA, they will specify that uh, you cannot share projects. And because of this, you cannot share projects and you cannot share information about it. So when you try to Google for information on chip design software, right, there's not a lot of information you can find. Yeah, because everybody's bound by the NDA. Okay? And producing a chip takes a long time, usually two months to one year, right, depending on how complex the chip is. So because of all these reasons, right, typically the only people who can design chips are those who work in a chip design company or for university. Okay, okay so... Something for okay, tiny tape out. So background of tiny tape out. So, so this company tries to change this thing. Okay. So it started by Matt Van, this guy here in 2022. So they describe themselves as a service that makes manufacturing ASIC affordable and accessible to students and makers. They use an open source blue chain and then yeah, they try to get a build a community on this. So now the question is, how do they do it? I think mean, I listed all the disadvantages, right? So first, they try to combine multiple designs together. So they spread out the cost of taping up to a larger group of people, okay? So then you see, uh, in this is a diagram of the chip of tiny tape out. You can see that there are many grids here, right? So every one of them is one design. And then they select the design using a multiplexer, okay? They also limit what you can do also. So if, for example, the area, 160 micrometer by 100 micrometer. It's quite small. Okay. They say that the logic level is only 3.3 volt digital pin, not 5 volt tolerant. They limit the number of IOs you have. So it input, it output, it by direction, reset anywhere and clock that's all. Okay. Because this is a limitation on the multiplexer. You put more pins there, then of course the multiplexer get more complicated. Okay. They use and mature and open source node, 130 nanometers on Skywater. So Skywater is the foundry. Okay. And today we talk about single digit nanometers at the cutting edge, right? So of course they, they cannot use a cutting edge. 130 nanometers is a basically about a two decade old technology already. Okay. So Skywater open source their process development, a process design kit. Basically, it contains their design rules, their libraries, and specifications of the node. Okay. And they rely on something called eFabless platform to submit to this one thing. Okay. These are the tools they use, all entirely open source. They use a Cocoa TV framework to verify your HDL design. They use a CTC tool called EOSYS, and everything is run on, it can be run remotely using a GitHub action. So you don't have to worry about installing all the tools and dependencies on your own machine. And of course, they provide very good video tutorials and documentation because chip design documentation is very hard to find. Okay, so this is what, uh, at the end, what they will provide to you, they provide the chip to you here in this one, this QFN chip mounted on a carrier board, which I have later, you can see here. Okay. Then they have to control the chip, right? They have a RP2040 MCU. This is the same MCU used by the Raspberry Pi Pico. 
Okay. So this Pico, this uh, chip is to control the multiplexer, means to select the design that you want, as well as configure the clock that is supplied to the chip. Okay. Then to control this RP2040, they have built a web app that communicates over web serial to this RP2040. Then you select the design. And as you can see, select the design that you want, which my design is design 21, as well as the clock, the clock that I want to supply to the chip. So these are the process I will go through with you what I did okay, to design this particular chip. Okay, so the first thing is the ideation. Uh, so you need to come up with what you want to what design you want to do. So the before you can design, you need to bear in mind the constraints that you have. Again, okay, eight inputs, eight outputs, eight bidirectional, one reset, one ending by one clock. The clock is also configurable up to 66.5 megahertz. Okay. So the at that time uh, when I wanted to submit to this, I was actually very near to the line. It was in September 2023. Yeah, I was only a few weeks away. So I internally this is my thought process. Uh, I just want to go through this design process. The design that I'm submitting uh, need not be a very complicated, it's a very, very simple one. Okay. But it's better that I do it successfully than I try something more complicated and I cannot finish. Okay. Who set the deadline? Oh, they are deadline. They are deadline. Yeah. Because they need to gather everybody or design and submit you know, one shot. Yeah. Okay. So uh the project that the idea that I decided to go with was a, a comfort speech thing clone using pulse speech modulation. Okay. So what exactly is this comfort speech thing? Okay, so it's actually an audio device, uh, very long ago already, invented in 1987. Okay, the concept behind this is very simple. It is just a digital to analog converter. Okay, so built based on the R2R resistor network. So R2R basically means that there's two set of resistors. One set of resistor is double the value of the other. Okay, every these are the parallel port pins. Okay, so all the parallel port pins, right? The most significant one basically contribute has a greater contribution to the final signal output. Okay, and there's a low pass filter also. Okay, so the idea behind this uh comfort speech thing is to provide low cost audio capability to machines that don't have sound cards. Because remember, sound cards were very rare and very expensive at that time. Okay, so this is quite cheap, just a few resistor and capacitor only. Okay, so mother, but the problem is like uh, the Tiny table at that time did not support analog, only purely digital. So how are you going to do an analog from digital? Okay, so the concept is called positive modulation. Basically, you're varying the amount of time the signal is on versus the time the signal is off. Okay, so this is called a duty cycle. Then the average of this duty cycle basically will give you an analog uniform. Okay, so the setup that I have here, okay, to show you that this thing works, Okay, so at first I have my ThinkPad T430, this 2012. It's a uh, more than 10 years old already. Okay, it's running Linux. Okay, the latest version of Ubuntu. Okay, uh, I have uh, okay, because this machine is I need a parallel port for this, and this machine is too new for a parallel port. Okay, so I use a uh, Express Card to parallel port adapter from StarTech. Okay, so Express Card is no longer being used today already. Like. It's out there already, but it's still advanced enough. It's it based on PCI Express. Okay, then uh, I play. I will play music through this parallel port using a program called Compose Music Player, which I wrote down about yeah a few years ago. Okay, then at the same time, right, I will also because of the popular demand, right, I also show the waveform using the oscilloscope that I brought here. <laughs> okay, so this oscilloscope is actually very new. This model was only released earlier this year. Okay, so these are the raw specifications. Uh, you can see. Okay. So uh, what I will show on the oscilloscope are two uh, from two channels. The first one is the PWN output. The second one is clock. Okay, and I understand not everybody can see this, and definitely people online cannot see this. So the a nice feature of this oscilloscope is that it supports VNC. So I you can see here the live it's basically screencasting. Uh, this one. Okay. So now I leave the screencast here. So this, and I will play some audio. Yeah. Okay. So you can see it's moving. Okay, I play a few seconds. So it works, huh? Basically. Okay, I saw. Okay. Frozen. Then you can see over here, right? The clock is detecting correctly. It's measuring correctly at 12 megahertz. So uh I basically I really configured 
sorry. Uh, ah, here. So just now I already set the clock to be self first and I selected my design already. Here. Okay. So let me add closer to zero. Okay. okay, so the after you come up with the project idea, right? Uh, so this is their process. You have to fork the template. So they provide a sub submission template on GitHub. Basically, the format that you must adhere to when it comes to submitting a project. Right? So this uh, project comes with the GitHub action already. So basically, uh, a way for you to execute all the testing and the uh, generation of the GTS file. Okay. How do you get a robot? They send to me, uh. So how much you do? Oh, I'll come to it. Yeah, I'll come to it. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a three figure sum, low three figure sum. Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. When it comes to uh, doing development like this, right? Uh, they practice something called test driven development. Even in software, also is also similar, lah. Right? Basically, you write the test first, then you write the code, lah. Okay. So, for this testing, right? They use a framework called CocoaDB. It's a Python HDL code simulation tool. So you write your tests in Python, okay? And then these tests are then run on your HDL, okay? Okay, so this, uh, for to, to test my uh, PWM logic, uh, it's actually quite simple. Uh. Basically, I just run through all the possible inputs and I check the output at every clock cycle, okay? So at the different, at the, let's say at a higher value, right? That means there's a the amount of time that the chip is on, the output is on, has to be more than time is off and vice versa. So I'm just doing in the comparison here. Okay. Then after you run the after you created the test bench, then uh you create you run the test GitHub action. Okay. So this everything is running in the cloud. Okay. You need to push your code, you need to push your code out of course. Then you run something called a pre-synthesis check. So pre-synthesis check means to check the functional run the functional test directly on HD output without doing the chip layout yet. So if that passes, right, then you will run something called a GDS action, okay? So a GDS action is basically generates something called a graphics design system file. So this, it contains the layout of the chip. Now in the PCB uh, equivalent, uh, this is something like a bubble. Yeah, okay. Then uh, you will show you the routing sets, uh, like say how much area I view. So just for this simple logic, right, PWM, I already use 7.62%. It shows you there's not really a lot of space they give you. Okay, so after they generate the GDS file, another set of, the same set of tests is run on the generated gates and layout. It's called a post synthesis check. Okay, and then this is a 3D render. They will show you also. Let me just show you. Can you see? Yeah, very nice. So this is the area that I have, and this is how much I've occupied already. Okay, so after that, you write the test now to write a write code. Uh. So they support very lot, which is very common for like FPGAs. So they also do that. Okay, so the very, very lot code, you can see the top part here. This is basically the, the constraints that they tell you. Like, okay, your chip has this input and output and all the control all the control lines that supply to your, your, to your very lot module. Okay, then uh, I only have just one register that is free running. It's just AB register. So if from start from zero, go all the way to uh, 256, they, they go back to zero again. Okay. So the logic behind this is that on a reset, which is active flow, I will set the counter back to zero. At every clock cycle, I increment it by one. Okay. Then to know when I need to uh, provide the duty cycle on off, right? The logic is right at the bottom. Uh. Sorry. Yeah, this. Okay. To determine whether I should uh, send the output one, of course, I make sure my reset reset is uh, not zero. Okay. And then my design is enabled because it's a multiplexer. Make sure my design is active as well as my current value, right? Is, is uh, above the PWM counter, which means now is the time to be on. Okay. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Okay. In this particular design, right? I actually had a issue, which is that the design passed the pre-synthesis check and failed the post-synthesis check. 
Very weird, right? It's like the test bench can pass one and fail the other. So why is that the case? It's because of something that's specific to ASICs compared to FPGAs. So in their website, right, they make this statement. Most FPGAs allow initial statements and flops are often in initialized with zero. This is not the case with ASICs, where flops will have a random initial value at power on. Initial statements are not allowed. So you must use an explicit reset. So basically what it's saying that the, the register here, right, you must set it manually to zero on the reset. You cannot assume that it will be zero on the start. So that's the reason why it failed the day out. But the functional check, right, which is done earlier, right, the, the test framework assumes that it's not only. Okay, so I, I tested this on FPGA, they recommend it also. Even though you, you test it fast, right? Your test case might be wrong. So I did test on my Arctic 7 FPGA to make sure that this one is working. Okay. I'll also verify with my oscilloscope. Okay. Uh not not this one. I haven't gotten this at that time. I verified with another one. Okay, so uh basically I checked the ratio law of the time when it's on and off. Okay, I for this right, I actually wrote another program have to test this up. Okay, so let me show. So that. Okay, so right now it's zero. Uh. So let's say, uh, they set a value of 64. You can see that the value, the duty cycle here, the oscilloscope is measuring my duty cycle about 25%, which is 64 over 256, two, two, right? About 25%. Okay, so correct. Then uh, I can put, one to eight. So this one is sending out over the parallel board. About half, right? Yeah. Then uh, one nine two. Okay, about seventy five percent. So so correct. Okay. So after you finish all this, right? Uh, they say that you have to write a data sheet, uh, because most commercial chips all come with data sheets, uh. So you should get into the good habit of doing this. So you basically specify all this information. Okay. okay then after you finish, uh, then you submit your create a pull request and submit to them. Of course, you have to pay them. Okay. Then uh, I only receive see this is a carrier board just a few weeks ago. Yeah. So wait nine months uh, for a simple design. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's just that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, because they are combining this design with a lot of other designs. So they are waiting to patch up all together. And also, why it takes so long? Because uh, they are also mounting the chip onto a PCB carrier board. That takes some manufacturing time. Usually, like, few weeks. Uh. Okay, so to, to conclude this, right? Uh, yeah, this study framework is really like Arduino for chip design. Okay, it really makes things very easy without, at the same time, you still get to learn something that is useful. Uh, okay, so it's very useful compared to industry setup tools. So, uh, I personally have used an industry chip design tool in university before. Yeah, and it is very, very different from this. It is very difficult to do. Okay, because of NDA, I cannot tell you what tool is that, how does it work. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, but basically, yeah, the item is really very, very easy. Okay. It extracts away the less important details because there's a lot of other you see, everything they run in the cloud for you. You don't have to set up any dependency, which is very, very challenging. Okay. Yeah. It's just set the SDL file. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, and uh, another thing is that it's following the path of PCB fabrication. That's what I feel. Because in the past, maybe decades ago, PCB fabrication is not really accessible to an uh, individual, and at least not at a very reasonable price that an individual can afford. But now almost everybody can just create a PCB and then get it fed at a very good price, right? So now chip design seems to be following this path. Maybe in a few more decades, right? It will be very common. Okay, so this is what... uh. I quote for hack the data. Perhaps one day submitting a GDS file to the fact will seem just as ordinary as sending couples to a PCB shop is today. Okay. Okay, so this just helped me to advertise. Uh. So tiny tape about eight. So I submitted tiny tape about four. Now it's eight already. And so it closes on 6 September. Okay, the good thing is that now they even support mixed signal designs. They support analog. 
Oh. So I don't even need to do this PWM anymore. Okay? <laughs> okay, so this is roughly the price. Okay. So they say that the early bird offers a US $150, including shipping. Okay. Uh, but I don't know how long this early bird offer lasts uh, because the full price is US $300. At the time I submitted, it was $150. But now the price got paid. Yeah. So considering it is very, very cheap, you know, you can submit this for this price, you get a custom chip of price. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Maybe, but they never say yet. So maybe one day once it hit only, then it stop. Yeah. Uh, maybe hundred people or something like that. Uh, so they call Saturday, yeah, batch eight. Batch eight. So the uh, tiny table of four closed in September. So I got it only a few weeks ago. So the tiny table of five people, right? I think they'll get that chip in the coming weeks already. Uh, I don't know about shorter lah. I didn't check. Yeah. But I think the time, the lead time will still be many, many months long. But you still have to go to the right. So every day, then you go for the right. Okay. Not strictly required. They recommend lah. Uh, they recommend. Of course, you should ideally write the test lah. Uh. You don't just write and just submit a test. If you write the test framework, then you test your FBJ because your test framework can be written on B also. The, the reason why I attended is the time you take on the dose, the, you know, the AIG, the so they also use it for a the they use the service. Then they claim that they are huge. How many times after they should I, I know, I don't think a blue, it's not the area, it's so small. Eh. Yeah. Very small, 130 nanometers, very old. So, so yeah. Can you can select for the Okay. Okay, so uh, it's all documented. So example, right? Let's come to here. Hey, sorry, this one. These are so you can see example. Those would be PWN. The other people are designed down here. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a long list, uh, Yeah. They provide the data sheet, so you can actually uh just see the project that you want. Just search it here. So do they have anything like community forum? Let's say you're stuck in some uh, Discord. They use Discord. They use Discord. Yeah. So I asked them for help before. Because uh okay, I did mention that the clock it can go up in 66 megahertz, right? Mm -hmm. At that time when I created uh, this clock uh, specification was not documented. I had to go and ask them you know, in the Discord, what is the maximum frequency you can set? Then at that time they also not very sure. So <laughs> but they tell me at least 10 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Which once you reach 10, 10 megahertz, right? This speed up is possible already. Because the previous tiny table of three, right? They only support in the kilohertz range. Mm -hmm. Which is, that means for this purpose of cover species cannot. It's too slow. This one need at least 10 megahertz. Then the sound will come out right. So when initially you get this parent board, mm -hmm. how long do you have to wait for this parent board to, to have this parent board to start? So I only got in June, uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, okay. you came, oh yeah, I came together. Yeah. Together. yeah. They yeah. come mounted right. for you. Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One unit. Okay. You just have to pay. You can, I think you can buy more PCBs. You just pay. You can populate up the one that needs to get with the design. We have to design together as possible. I mean, uh, can you can you can submit multiple designs? Same. Can. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's because there's a limitation on the multi better. But, but then how do you first of all based on the top screen, then you how do you think of what design like for example your this speech or this uh, how do you how do you the design is up to you, your idea is up to you. Uh. Okay, I'll give you an example. Other people, they make, for example, something they can transmit VGA. They, they connect to a VGA monitor. They can play game on. I saw. Oh. Yeah, so many, many designs. You can Google for the tiny table. You can see the full list of projects. Oh. Okay. Any other questions? You know how the uh, other things are working in the new... Oh, I don't know. I haven't read that yet. Okay. Uh, a bit, uh, other than the... I think the price is more expensive. They charge every pin. I think it's 40 US dollars. Every analog pin. I think it's very expensive to, for them to implement. Yeah. 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 Y
and you need to buy a minimum of two tiles, I believe. So which means the cost is at least three hundred US dollars only. Uh, I I not sure lah. Yeah, but it's not cheap So every analog pin really. <laughs> Possibly it's much cheaper. It's much cheaper, yeah. Cannot believe a few years ago. Who would believe? <laughs> okay, I think then that's all. Okay. Then thank you very much.